Thank you for attending our Indiana-Michigan Power Webinar, The Fourth Utility, Energy Tips for Compressed Air Systems. My name is Chris Guthrie, and I am the host of today's webinar. We will be sending everyone a follow-up email within the next couple of days that will include a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation materials and the playback link to the recording of today's webinar. Because of the large number of attendees, we will only be accepting written questions from you today. Please submit questions by typing them in the chat or Q&A windows on your screen. We will take some time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions, or we will follow up with you separately after the webinar has concluded. To expand the presentation to full screen, click on the diagonal arrow icon in the top right corner of the slide. We will be conducting polls during the presentation. A polling window will appear on the bottom right of your screen, and you will be asked to answer one or more multiple choice questions. We really appreciate your participation in our polls. I'm opening our first poll now. Please be aware that you are not the only participant today. The names of other attendees are not being shown to you for reasons of privacy. Now let me introduce you to today's presenters. Mike Carter is a senior energy engineer and has a BS in engineering and an MBA degree from The Ohio State University. He has worked with various EPRI centers supporting electro-technology applications and spent 10 years conducting due diligence for the technology commercialization. Mike is a certified energy manager from the Association of Energy Engineers. He writes articles for the newsletter, answers ask and expert inquiries, and develops webinars on energy topics. Also joining us today are subject matter experts, Jason Whitman and Barb Buenerkew. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Mike to start the presentation off for us today. Well, thank you, Chris, and uh, welcome, everyone, to our webinar today. Uh, we're talking about the fourth utility. And you might say, well, Mike, what are you talking about? There's electricity, there's gas, there's water. Well, compressed air systems consume so much energy that they're often considered a uh, fourth utility. And in fact, in many compressed air installations, they're often pretty significant and underutilized savings possibilities. Included in these would be things like energy recovery, maybe pressure reduction, certainly leak reduction, and uh, oftentimes optimization of operations either through correct choice of a control or maybe the choice of compressor size. But experience shows that a, a comprehensive and unbiased analysis of your compressed air system will almost always result in improved overall economy. So we're going to start today and just talk a little bit about the basics of compressed air systems and what are some of the pieces, parts to that. We're going to look at some uh, savings opportunities on the supply side through controls, air treatment on the demand side as well. Some additional savings ideas, uh, focusing on leak repair, uh, proper uses of compressed air, how to perform a high quality audit, and how to uh, achieve some uh, energy savings through heat recovery as well. So let's dive in and just uh, look at kind of the big picture of things here. As you can see from the DOE estimate here, about half of all generated compressed air is essentially wasted. And this breakdown's been, been proven time and again in, in countless facilities. Uh, a lot of the compressed air is going to be consumed by leaks, uh, demand that's really not necessary, overpressurization, and uh, things like inappropriate uses. If you look at a compressed air system uh, pieces parts here, uh, this air distribution system basically links the various components of the compressed air system to deliver air to the point of use with minimal pressure loss. At least that's the ideal goal. The specific configuration of a distribution system, well, it depends on the needs of the individual plant, but frequently consists of basically an extended network of main lines, as you can see here, uh, branch lines as well, and valves and air hoses, and all these different components. We're going to take a look at some of these a little closer as we go along. Uh, but here's some three main components of waste in compressed air systems. Uh, every compressed air system has a leak. I think we'd all agree to that. Now, Fortunately, some accept this as a common operating expense, and uh, some actually find leaks, but they just don't do anything about it. 
Corsair system consumption increases when operating at higher than necessary operating pressure, so reduced or varying pressure at the point of use can slow production and even cause defects. And usually the first response to fix an artificial demand problem is to increase pressure or, for instance, uh, compensate for leaks. And that's the idea behind the thinking anyway. But if you increase discharge pressure, pressure, you're also increasing air demand throughout the whole system, particularly through unregulated uses such as leaks and open blowing. Those just get worse and worse. Inappropriate uses means anytime you use compressed air, when you could use alternative means, either for cooling or materials movement. We'll look at a number of specific examples of that here in a minute. Uh, most motor-driven systems uh, have some flaws built in from the very beginning. Uh, the first flaw is assuming that, well, more is always better, more capacity, bigger horsepower, et cetera. Not a lot of thought initially given to system efficiency, not always a good plan for, well, what if demand increases or decreases and how are we going to approach that? And unfortunately, the focus uh, seems to be on paying the least price possible for a new compressed air system. And, and all these assumptions really are true for not only new systems, but upgrades to existing systems as well. Well, that's a lot of bad news. The good news is that if these prevalent attitudes can be overcome, there, there are really a number of ways to make improvements. And so here are a number of those listed. Applying any of these strategies, that, and we'll review some of these in more detail here, you'll get noticeable energy savings. And we really feel like these are realistic and really conservative numbers for savings. Uh, reducing leaks, proper compressor controls, optimizing your internal components, system components, and if you can tap into your compressor as a heat source, you can get, get even further ahead. One objective or major objective of, of controls is to keep compressors off when they're not needed. Of course, that's going to obviously reduce energy use, but you also want controls to operate most efficiently, uh, particularly at part load. Here's a plot of full load horsepower versus compressor capacity, and there's a, a lot of different um, methods of control listed here. Uh, there's um, inlet valve modulation, there's um, blowdown, there's variable speed drive, and whatever control you use, if you're operating at you know, 95 to 100% capacity, most of them are going to run pretty efficiently. It's when you're dropping down into the you know 50%. 40 to 60 percent, if you just look at this 50 percent area, you can see that variable speed drive controls are going to pull uh, a lot less horsepower than uh, other methods, variable displacement, two-step control, uh, blowdown control, et cetera. And you can take a closer look at this. But the idea is, that use, is to use appropriate controls, reduce your air usage, lower your input energy. Most industrial plants have multiple compressors supplying the airflow. Maybe that's true of your plant. And of course, if they're not properly controlled, units end up fighting each other, basically causing an air compressor uh, tug of war. And this is an energy efficient nightmare. Uh, more units run than necessary. Units run at higher pressure than needed. There's excess of cycling or idling of units. And this results in an unstable system pressure that increases energy costs and also increases uh, maintenance as well. well. What's a solution to that? Well, one solution is a master, system master controls. And what do they do? Well, they basically monitor and regulate system components. They gather trending data in order to minimize maintenance and operating costs as well. And they not only operate the compressors, but they also oversee filters, dryers, drains, they monitor, say, the rate of change in pressure. They predict when to turn on additional compressors, very important decision. And then they actually now these days learn and adapt to patterns of system behavior and, send, and even send service alerts. So they're kind of like the conductor uh, of an orchestra, trying to make all the components work together uh, optimally. And here's uh, kind of a 
uh, typical master control operation diagram. And in this one, um, compressors A and B are basically different size fixed speed compressors uh, in, uh, using load and unload controls. Compressor C here uses a variable frequency drive, so it's kind of like a trim compressor. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. We've also included a, a storage uh, receiver here um, with a pressure sensor. And what happens is the master control basically uh, selects the control uh, schemes to meet airflow requirements at minimum energy consumption. It does this pretty seamlessly. Um, it learns and adapts, switches on the right size compressor based on prediction of pressure drop rather than re reacting at specific set points. So uh, and that's kind of what the big picture uh, of what this master control or how it integrates with all the components. How does it adapt to changing uh, compressed air system demands? Of course, that those are fluctuating all the time. Well, it does it in, in three ways. It looks at the rate of change in pressure, and it does some prediction of when to, you know, like I said, turn on additional compressors. And of course, it's always learning and adapting to patterns of system behavior, how the system is being operated, and it's trying to always minimize, minimize idling and pressure swings as well. Take a closer look at uh, at what advanced energy management by master controls is accomplishing. Well, first of all, it's, it's reducing uh, run and idling time, typically seeing two to ten percent savings there. It's improving system pressure performance, you know, as much as ten percent savings there, and it's reducing uh, artificial demand or system pressure. Uh, so, you know, in, in effect, it's reducing starts, maintains stable pressure control, reduces artificial demand losses. So it's really a lot of benefits uh, to using that. Uh, two other additional benefits of master control are uh, energy monitoring um, and remote uh, monitoring capability. Uh, advanced monitoring, monitoring and communication uh, really enables supply-side air energy assessment. And of course, that's even required by you know, ISO 5001 energy management in terms of uh, reporting features, so it's gonna help you out there. And then along with remote monitoring, uh, that system performance data, well, well, it's accessible anywhere, anytime. In fact, technicians can also view diagnostic codes uh, prior to service to be able to uh, prepare uh, some solutions when they see some problems on the system. So those are two big uh, additional benefits as well. Uh, next poll here, uh, which of the following represent energy waste in compressed air systems? Appreciate you picking which ones you feel are representative of energy waste. Pre always appreciate the participation in our polls. Give us some feedback on uh, whether we're communicating well here today. While you're doing that, I'm going to move on to talk about master controls and variable speed drives. Uh, a recommended technique for operating multiple compressors is basically to fit uh, one compressor with uh, VFD com uh, controls, variable uh, frequency drive controls, and designated as what we call a trim compressor. And all the other compressors are designated as uh, base load compressors. Um, and so, uh, and th those will always, when you turn them on, they'll run at full capacity whenever they're on. So the idea is that you start meeting demand with the VFD trim compressor, and then once that trim compressor uh, meet, reaches its maximum capacity, the master control hands off the load to a, a baseline compressor, which then allows the VFD to go back to uh, trim operation. And this diagram illustrates this, but it also highlights a potential, what we call a control gap problem, when the compressor capacity is roughly equal to the base load compressor capacity. So in this case, we have a trim compressor, 125 horsepower, rated output 100 horsepower for the base load. And what happens is every time the master control hands off load to the base load compressor, let's say right here, the two compressors cycle on and off until the demand increases enough for just the trim compressor uh, to handle uh, the additional load. Unfortunately, though, this results often in both compressors running at the same time because you have this very small gap 
in control. And even with a master control, that's really difficult to avoid. And so what's the solution there? Well, if you size your trim compressor just a little larger than your base pro compressor, or really significantly larger, in this case we're looking at 150 horsepower trim compressor and 100 uh, horsepower base load, and then you can meet the demand a little longer, as you can see here, uh, where the uh, and then the master control handoff occurs when the trim compressor can ramp down, but not all the way down. And this is shown uh, here uh, in this graph. And then uh, basically the control gap problem then uh, is avoided. So uh, and it keeps, of course, the pressure steady as well. And like we have we the results at, of the pullback, if you'd like to share those. Yeah. I appreciate it. which of the following represents uh, energy waste in the compressed air systems, and you can't go wrong here. They, they all do. Leaks, artificial demand, inappropriate uses, and we'll be looking at all three of those here uh, a little more closely in just a second. If you look at your uh, air, uh, your uh, distribution system and compressed air system, uh, there's a number of accessories uh, that are used to treat compressed air and they're, what, are, what are they doing? Where they're removing contaminants like dirt, lubricant, and, and water. And uh, they're trying to keep the proper pressure and quantity of air moving through the system. And th these accessories include compressor aftercoolers, filters, separators, dryers, uh, heat recovery equipment, lubricators, pressure regulators, air receivers, traps, automatic grain. So you can see there's a lot. This just represents a few of those. And uh, we're going to take a closer look right here at uh, different kinds of dryers because there's several major choices. We're going to look at four major choices and kind of talk about the pros and cons of each of those. The first of these is what's called a refrigerant, refrigerant dryer. And basically that just cools the air uh, to a point below its dew point where water condenses out and then that's separated uh, away. Uh, of course, it gets so cold that the compressed air then has to be reheated to around room temperature so that the condensation doesn't form on the outside of the piping system. Our refrigerant dryers are used with dew points between about 35 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit and are only limited downwards by, by the freezing point of the uh, condensed water. And they're pretty low power requirement, about 20 kilowatts per 100 cubic feet per minute uh, of supply. A desiccant dryers. Uh, there's different types. They include silicon gel, activated alumina, molecular sieves, and uh, in some cases more than one desiccant type you know, could possibly be used together with others. Uh, in most cases you have a larger particle size, like a quarter inch or more of these um, desiccants used as a buffer zone at the inlet while a smaller particle size desiccant, you know, an eighth to up to a quarter inch or so is used for final drawing, drying. And when very low dew points are required, a molecular sieve desiccant is added as a, typically the final drying agent. Power requirements are, are quite a bit more here, primarily because it requires uh, some purge air uh, to regenerate that desiccant uh, occasionally. You can also get um, specially designed membranes uh, to act as a dryer in a compressed air system, and how do they work? Well, basically they allow one type of uh, gas, water vapor, to pass through the membrane pores faster than other gases like air, which reduces, of course, the amount of water vapor in the airstream at the outlet of the membrane uh, dryer, uh, effectively suppressing the dew point. Dew points typically are achieved at around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. You can get down to even minus 40, but that's at the expense of uh, quite a bit more additional uh, purge air loss. Again, a pretty high power requirement, three to four kilowatts per 100 CFM. In a twin tower heated compression dryer operation, kind of see it here, they're filled with um, desiccant. Uh, you have desiccant in a saturated tower, let's say it's on the left here, that's being regenerated by means of heater compression and all the hot air leaving the discharge of the air compressor. And then the total airflow passes through the air after cooler and then enters a, a drying tower. These towers are cycled back and forth to regenerate the desiccant. The first one, this one's saturated and air is blown through to remove the moisture. And then this one's uh, saturated and 
air is blown through that and back and forth. And it's again a pretty no purge air required, pretty low uh, 0.8 uh, kilowatts per 100 CFM requirement. Here's a, a table that kind of summarizes that different dew points achievable. Some applications require you know a very low dew point. You're going to look at you know the desiccant dryers, uh, but some uh, don't. Uh, air capacity reduction in a couple cases there is none. In a couple cases you have a pretty good purge air requirement. Power consumption differs quite a bit. Uh, you know, heat of compression, refrigerant is pretty low. And there's some special needs in a desiccant. You usually have to filter better, um, keep oils out especially. Uh, membranes, you just don't get a lot of flow through those. And then heat of compression, uh, you're typically, you need a lot of high heat. And so you are typically can only use these with centrifugal compressors and oil-free rotary screw compressors. Even before uh, beginning with leaks, uh, it's important to consider what piping materials you have. So let's look at that. Uh, the type of piping material will really impact your air quality, not only now, but also most certainly in the future, because contaminants like oil and dust will enter the compressed air system. They're going to build up in your pipes. And when air is not flowing freely, we would call that turbulent flow, which is what you're trying to really avoid. The goal is to pick pipe materials that will provide you know, years of unrestricted, what we call laminar, laminar airflow. And these are these are pretty bad uh, examples here. Uh, the worst of the worst, it usually isn't that bad, but uh, it's still uh, going to build up and impact pressure drop, et cetera. And so here's a chart that gives an overview of common piping materials with their advantages and their uh, disadvantages, uh, whether it's iron, copper, stainless steel, uh, polyvinyl chloride, PVC, aluminum. Uh, one important note is really we want to recommend avoiding using PVC piping. It's lightweight and inexpensive, definitely, but it really is a safety concern. OSHA actually has ruled against it unless it's above ground and encased in a shatterproof material. Really would uh, encourage you to consider copper and aluminum piping as a better choice. They're pretty easy to install and they certainly resist buildup of uh, contaminants. Uh, there are pressure drops uh, every step of the way in a compressed air system. That's illustrated by this uh, figure here, whether it's in valves or elbows or just pipe in general, the receivers, the components, the filters, dryers, et cetera. And uh, particularly in uh, two different areas, uh, in one area, uh, you, well, if you look at the formula for pressure drop, you'll notice a couple of things. One is pressure drops inversely proportional to the fifth power of the pipe diameter and roughly directly proportional to the square of the speed flowing through it. So uh, the higher speed you get, you get, the bigger the pressure drop, and the smaller the pipe diameter, the bigger the pressure, pressure drop as well. In fact, because it's pipe diameter is uh, related to the proportional to the fifth power of the uh, inversely proportional to the fifth power of the pipe diameter. If you decrease pressure, uh, if you double the pipe diameter, you've decreased pressure drop by 32 times. So it really pays to spend just a little bit more, use larger pipe, pipe diameter. Uh, with regard to total pressure drop from the compressor to the point of use, typically the rule of thumb is you really want to keep it less than 10% of the compressor's discharge pressure. It's just uh, kind of a benchmark there. So some other uh, pressure uh, things that you can do to uh, avoid big pressure drops, you know, use larger hoses for larger tools and longer lengths. Rule of thumb, you know, go from half inch to three quarter when you're above three horsepower tools or greater than 50 foot uh, lengths. Certainly only, you know, use the pressure you really need. Uh, you reduce system pressure by about 10%, it'll save about 10%. The rule of thumb is for every pound per square inch increase in discharge pressure, Energy consumption will increase by about 0.8 to 1% for a system with 100 psig, with you know your normal um, large amount of unregulated usage. Air receivers uh, in a system. You can see here's a dry receiver here, wet receiver here. Uh, they have different uh, uses, different functions uh, in a system. Uh, they, it can provide dampening of pressure pulsations. They can stabilize uh, pressure 
kind of flatten the load peaks, and they provide time, uh, time needed to start uh, or avoid, avoid starting uh, a cycling uh, standby error. And it's a really important point there. Storage buys time. It doesn't really buy capacity. Probably one of the major uh, fallacies uh, that's uh, misused out there today. Uh, there's different point of views on the location of a primary air receiver in a plant air system. If the receiver is located soon after the compressor discharge, and the compressor is a piston type, so maybe you know, here's a compressor, and maybe that's, that's soon after here. Well, that receiver can act as a dampener for pressure pulsations. So that's good. Uh, and if the receiver is located before the compressed air dryer, which again, there's the dryer, so this is a good example of that, uh, it'll provide additional radiant cooling and maybe drop out some of the condensate and entrained oil, which benefits the dryer. That's all good. However, the receiver will be filled with saturated air, and if there's a sudden demand that exceeds the capacity rating of the compressor and the matching dryer, well, uh, the dryer can be overloaded, and it won't be able to supply as much air, and that air will be at a higher dew point than uh, is required. So, okay, uh, maybe let's put the receiver uh, after the compressed air dryer. Uh, of course, those advantages I just mentioned are lost. However, if the receiver's uh, filled with compressed air, which has been dried, and a sudden demand in excess of the compressor and dryer capacity, is is experienced that that'll meet can be met with that dried air, and you won't overload the dryer, and the pressure dew point is not affected. So, well, one way to resolve this dilemma is this is to install storage both upstream uh, here and downstream of the dryer. Just remembering that the storage downstream of the dryer must be equal to or larger than the storage upstream of the driver, kind of as a rule of thumb there as well. Next poll question, um, reducing the discharge pressure setting from 100 PSI down to 90 PSI will save about what percentage of compressed air operating costs? We have four choices here. Pick the one you think is most accurate, and we'll take a look at the answers here in just a minute. Let's, let's turn our attention back to leaks. We've talked about that a little bit before. There's basically two types of leaks. Uh, first of all, there's intentional leaks. Those happen when compressed air is being misapplied, often referred to as inappropriate uses. And a lot of these intentional leaks uh, can be corrected through employee education. You see some examples of that here. Unintentional leaks happen over time, generally. and uh, a lot of people, that, unfortunately, though, think the small leak is is uh, really no big deal, and it's due to, to you know these things that happen over time, uh, poor workmanship, degrades, corrosion, et cetera, higher operating pressure, system pressures. So, how, just how much does a leak cost? And you've probably heard some of this in the past. Um, and if you look at this chart here, it has leak size and then the cost on an annual basis based upon operating full time and costing you at least 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And if you look at uh, just a quarter inch leak at 110 PSIG system pressure, you know, it could cost you uh, just that one leak will cost you almost $18,000 a year and uh, having to make up that. Uh, CFM of uh, air that's leaking out. Now, of course, this is assumptions is that, that it's at full load, which is not, it's not going to occur 100% of the time. But imagine just you know how many leaks your system already has, and it really adds up. If you want to calculate that yourself, uh, there's a formula here. We're going to leave that here for you. Uh, and the second thing to understand is that leaks affect more than your utility bill. They can cause a drop in system pressure, causes rapid compressor cycling, and can increase your production and maintenance costs as well. Let's look at uh, what we can do about that. When you're investigating leak detection, you'll, you'll generally find three primary methods to detect those leaks. The first two are the simplest, right here, listen and feel, or use soapy water. 
but they require direct contact with the leak and they don't tell you how large the leak is. The third uh, other, you know, is uh, ultrasonic leak detection, which is really the industry standard. Let's take a look at what's involved in that. And Mike, really, we have the results of our pullback if oh, you'd like to share good. those. Uh, absolutely, reducing the discharge pressure setting from 100 to 90 PSI, a 10 PSI drop will save about 10%. So B is the most uh, accurate answer. Um, it could be even more, uh, but uh, in that ballpark, about 1% for every PSI uh, drop in system pressure. Very worthwhile investigating. But if you have leaks and you're using ultrasonic leak detection, it really requires a couple of things. It requires special equipment. You can see the kind of equipment here is a picture of it in use. Uh, and of course, that special equipment is going to require some training. But it will give you an idea of leak size and it'll help you prioritize which leaks to fix you know, first in what order. Let's look at uh, another area we touched on, and that is inappropriate uses. As we said before, compressed air is an extremely inefficient process, and we really recommend that you don't use compressed air for applications where anything else will work, such as local cooling, uh, where you can use fans, uh, drying can use fans and heat lamps. Um, Product kickers on conveyor belts can use mechanical arms instead of of, of air. Uh, if you look at, so here's a whole list of things that you really don't want to use um, compressed air for. Asparging is basically aerating, agitating, oxygenating, or percolating liquid with compressed air. Um, and this is particularly probably not a good idea because liquid can be whipped into a dry gas, increasing the dew point. Uh, padding is using compressed air to transport liquids and light solids. So the, rule, the bottom line is, if possible, switch to motors, mechanical actuators, and any other mean to accomplish the same function. We'll look at a couple of case studies here where they did that and saved quite a bit. So why do a compressed air audit? Well, many system owners don't have a clear picture of how their system operates or really how much energy it consumes. So Compressed air audits are a great way to baseline your system and really visualize what's happening before you try to make any improvements or add any unnecessary compressors. Uh, conducting an, a good quality compressed air audit will help you know the components of compressed air cost. It'll help you when you're trying to prioritize what am I going to do first and second and next, and uh, it'll achieve that optimum mix of components for existing, and then uh, it'll help you think about uh, what you need for the future. And so there's a couple of different types of audits. Uh, they vary widely in scope, quality, and price. Uh, demand side audits are typically very comprehensive uh, and very costly. And it's going to look at things like is the layout of the piping system properly designed? Uh, what's the pressure drop and efficiency? Is the condensate removal system adequate? Uh, it'll look at, well, what's the load profile, the compressor over time? Um, will advanced control strategies or storage options be needed? Uh, it might ask and look into um, can pressures be lowered or existing air compressors replaced with another source of energy such as blowers, vacuums, or air conditioning, which we just got done talking about. More common, however, are supply-side audits. And they'll ask things like, well, what are the after-cooler and separator efficiencies? Uh, how effective is the condensate uh, separation? Uh, how effective is that? Uh, what's the dryer size? Uh, is it suitable for the current application? Is a filter needed to prevent contamination of the dryer? Is a receiver tank adequate in terms of location and size? Is, it, is the receiver drain trap operating properly? Uh, those kind of things. But in any case, uh, whichever way you go, a, a high quality audit process typically will involve these five steps. Uh, first step is really a physical walkthrough of the plant, not just a compressor room. Uh, and it's important to discuss the desired outcomes of the audit at this stage as well. 
Step two, you're really measuring what we call specific power, which is kilowatts draw per 100 CFM of supply. That's what we call a key performance indicator, or KPI. Usually seven to 10 days is long enough to get a good picture. Uh, you're gonna measure power, a pressure, not only at one location, but multiple locations, and flow, and do all that about every 20 seconds for an extended period of time. Step three allows you to conduct, conduct what-if scenarios with upgrades, expansion, and impact of new equipment. And of course, don't overlook at this point what we call opportunity costs. In other words, not being able to run a piece of equipment because the system can't supply enough airflow. That could be a huge cost. Number four is implement all the requirements or recommendations. And if you're adding capacity, of course, check piping size that it's adequate to supply uh, with the additional capacity. And finally, uh, this step is typically required actually to even receive a rebate uh, verifying performance. Plus, whatever you do to do that will often allow you to continuously monitor performance uh, as uh, in the future, which is a real plus as well. So these are great five recommended steps for a good audit of a compressed air system. Let's look at um, heat recovery. Uh, for air-cooled compressors and water-cooled compressors. Uh, a limiting factor for energy recovery for air-cooled compressors would be the distance between the compressor and the building being heated. It really should be short, uh, hopefully just an adjoining building, for instance. Also, Heat recovery is often limited to just the colder parts of the year, especially in, of course, our climate, if it's going to be used for air as opposed to heating water. Uh, and uh, airborne heat energy recovery is more common on small and medium-sized compressors, uh, typically, as well. And uh, on oil-lubricated compressors, and here's an example of that, it's the oil which takes part in compression is the factor that limits the possibilities to reach higher uh, temperatures of its cooling water. In centrifugal compressors, the temperature levels are a lot lower, thereby for its uh, limited in the degree of recovery. In fact, the uh, performance of the compressor can be negatively affected uh, by uh, high water temperatures. Uh, water cool, and then you can see here, use a rule of thumb here, you get a, you can recover about 5,000 BTUH of energy for every 100 CFM of capacity on air cool compressors. Uh, you can usually get a temperature rise 30 to 40 degrees above the air inlet temperatures if you're bringing air from outside or maybe you're bringing it in from uh, inside the facility. Uh, water cool compressors, uh, it's best suited for compressors with a motor power over 10 kilowatts and higher. It's a little more complex installation than airborne uh, energy recovery, and you typically are gonna have to have some pumps, heat exchangers, regulator valves, and that kind of thing uh, uh, implemented into that. You typically uh, can get water temperatures of about 130 degrees uh, so you get about a 60-degree, 50-to-60-degree temperature rise with water-cooled compressors. So air-cooled compressors typically a little more feasible, cost-effective. Let's look at some examples of manufacturers with significant compressed air and some of the problems they've had and how they solved those and what the results were. If you look at a container blow molding plant in North Carolina, um, blow molders, if you're not aware, require a very clean, dry, compressed air and a very high operating pressure, about 600 uh, PSIG, in order to produce uh, soda bottles. Uh, this particular plant had some problems. What were the problems? Well, they had a blow-off rate setting that was pretty high uh, that vented compressed air unnecessarily. Uh, so anytime the uh, air decreased below 87%, it would assume it's not needing much and it would just blow it off. 
Uh, and then three booster compressors had severe internal and external leakage rates around the valve cover plates and unloader valves. They also discovered uh, several hundred straight cubic feet per minute of low pressure leaks and over 500 straight cubic feet of high pressure leaks in the distribution system. And they also saw that there was vortex coolers being used, which is uh, supplied by compressed air for cooling and hardening the bottlenecks, which was a pretty wasteful uh, use of compressed air. So what did they do? Well, they changed their blow-off set point uh, below about 75%, and that was acceptable without any risk of surge. They replaced the vortex coolers by a cabinet cooler. They used electromechanical vibrator to prevent jamming of preformed feed lines instead of compressed air. Uh, they implemented a central vacuum system to replace the Venturi vacuum producers for pick and place operation. And the, uh, then they also replaced that, uh, the unloader valve and cover plates around the booster compressors with newer, more advanced models as well. What were the results? Well, they significantly, uh, just lowering the blow-off set point saved over $100,000. The other action saved an additional $80,000, so a pretty good savings. Uh, by applying some of the things we talked about today. This is a printing uh, plant in Georgia. They had um, 15 new presser, presses. Of course, they all use compressed air for uh, three different reasons. Uh, there's batching modules. They use each of those use about 20 straight cubic feet at 130 psi. And then they had collators and print engines that also they used much less, 1.1 straight cubic feet at about 100 psi. Um, the problem was that air demand had doubled over time to about 600 straight cubic feet per minute. And one of the biggest reasons is because they used open blowing air bars. Uh, they also experienced the fact that joggers and lift cylinders were unable to work properly to manufacture recommended pressure levels. The hoses supplying the branching modules uh, from, the, uh, from the airdrops were too small. Uh, many push to connect tube fittings leaked uh, on startup, and then condensation was collecting on the metal components of the print engines, causing engine shutdown. Very bad. <laughs> so solutions were to, uh, to convert the compressed air bars to blowers, to replace hoses with shorter and larger diameter hoses, and to use a dedicated storage tank uh, on every module to reduce source pressure, and also onboard compressors were converted to operate manually. Results were that they significantly decreased each machine's air demand from 27 down to four and a half straight cubic feet per minute. They took a 70 horsepower compressor capacity offline, and that allowed them to avoid having to purchase you know, a much more compressor capacity at, a, of course, a great uh, high cost uh, of investment. So what would be uh, next steps uh, for all of us here today? Uh, maybe a step might be, uh, we really need to do a facility air system audit and do a high quality one that was, we just talked about. Or maybe you need some on-site training or sending people off to a seminar or maybe engage an air system design uh, consultant. Uh, the Compressed Air uh, Gas Institute, you can go to their website, there's manufacturer's performance data sheets on equipment, it allows you to compare one with another. The DOE has some compressed air workshops that they uh, put on. Uh, they have one coming up actually November 15th in Indianapolis on fundamentals of compressed air systems. They have another in uh, mid-December, December 13th and 14th in Norwood, Massachusetts on advanced management of compressed air systems. So a great opportunity to get some uh, good uh, education and training. And then, of course, you can never go wrong going to the, uh, looking at the source book by Compressed Air Challenge, Improving Compressed Air System Performance. Uh, it's a great, uh, very uh, important uh, resource to have on hand when you're evaluating your compressed air systems. Uh, last poll for today uh, is, would you like some uh, help in finding energy waste in your facility from, uh, any, from Indiana and Michigan Power? And how valuable was this webinar today? How, what, did you get some value out of what you learned today? Let us know. You've got the five choices there as well. Give you a second to... Uh, 
participate in that poll. Really appreciate your feedback. Always uh, available to help in any way we can. And while you're doing that, I just want to let you know that we have uh, three uh, additional webinars upcoming. This afternoon, we're looking at energy efficient schools and K-12 K universities um, specifically for that segment. And then we're going to look at what we call uh, energy efficiency benefits. And uh, the, the theme behind this is, is that the impact on your utility bill is just one of many, many benefits by energy efficiency upgrades. And a lot of these benefits, like increased productivity of employees, better uh, reduced health care costs because of uh, uh, reducing the uh, building-related sicknesses uh, by doing upgrades, that is real financial dollars that you can add to your uh, project justification for energy efficiency upgrades. And we're going to quantify all of those type of uh, non-utility financial benefits. We'll also mention some non-financial benefits as well, like attaining a, uh, attaining a, a green building certification um, and uh, maybe retaining you know, and recruiting employees more uh, effectively because you have a nicer facility in terms of uh, indoor environmental quality. And then the last one uh, in December, we've gone to uh, some of the major uh, trade shows on uh, lighting, and uh, we've uh, discovered quite a few innovations, particularly in LED lighting, that we want to share with you. And so uh, we've, I've mentioned just a few of those today, but there's many more. And uh, I think you'll benefit a lot. You'll be amazed, really, at uh, what uh, lighting innovations have occurred over the last few years. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason. He's going to tell you more about Indiana and Michigan Power's energy efficiency programs. Terrific. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, and I also want to say thank you to all of our participants, whether you're a customer of ours or a trade ally or even an energy professional who joined us to um, learn about compressed air. So a lot of valuable information was given, uh, anything from talking about master controls to air leaks to audits and to repairs. And, so our goal really was kind of twofold here. We wanted to educate you about compressed air, get you thinking about how it's used in your facility. Um, and then and secondly, we would be remiss if we didn't steer you towards our incentive um, programs and our rebate program. So what you see here is uh, kind of an overview of our 2017 programs. Now these are going to extend into 2018 as well with very similar incentive amounts. Um, and the content today we talked mostly about compressed air which really a lot of the incentives and rebates for this type of program would fall into our custom program um, and you see what's listed here is our prescriptive custom new construction and small business direct install but you know primarily the custom program would handle most of our applications for compressed air um, you see here we list uh, our, our caps for uh, each facility and each company at 50,000 and 100,000 per company per year. So they're pretty lucrative incentives and we encourage you to visit electricideas.com forward slash work. This is the site that uh, all of our program information resides. Uh, we, we go into detail about our different programs, how to apply, and I've also listed my contact information here. So please uh, participate in our programs. Uh, we talked about, uh, Mike specifically talked about audits and leak repairs. And I just kind of wanted to emphasize that we, part of our program, the incentives do cover the cost of, of repair leaks. We, we do not cover or incentivize audits, but um, that shouldn't deter you from doing that as an important first step to determine uh, what your facility um, has and what it, what it needs as well. So that's the kind of the overview of our programs. We also have programs geared towards lighting and HVAC and other measures as well. But I wanted you to be um, particularly informed about our, about our custom programs and how they can apply to your um, compressed air um, situation. So that's just a little bit of an overview. Um, again, my program information is listed there, um, my phone number and also my email as well. Um, we also, one more thing here, we also have a um, auditing library, for lack of better words, that we're building. Um, some tools that will be available to our customers to include a leak detector um, and some other tools as well. So we'll be getting out some of that information to you. If you have questions or would like to uh, 
check out or, or loan one of our tools, again, contact me at the number listed or my email, and we'd be glad to um, come to your site and provide you the tools, and you can check them out and use them at your leisure and, and, and get them back to us. So having said that, I just want to say thanks again for joining our, our webinar. I appreciate the insights that Mike brought and for all of your participation as active listeners today. So thank you, and I'll turn it back over to either Mike or Chris, who'd ever like to uh, take the helm. And we'd like to open up for our questions here. If you have any questions about anything we've covered or just compressed our systems overall or you know, even energy efficiency uh, overall, just type those in the Q&A text box and be happy to answer those. Looks like we have a question about uh, air distribution system uh, layout. Uh, and we talked about that very briefly. I think it's, um, yeah, right here. Uh, when you design an air distribution system layout, it's best to place the air compressor and its related accessories where temperature inside the plant is the lowest. Uh, here's your motors and compressors, et cetera. Typically, though, not below freezing. Uh, also, a projection of future demands and tie-ins to the existing distribution system should be considered. We talked a little bit about that in terms of uh, planning uh, for expansion in the future. Uh, the headers, you see here, here's some header piping here, should have a slight slope to allow drainage of condensate, and uh, it should have drop legs from the bottom side of the, of the header, um, uh, which you can see, I guess, uh, to allow collection and drainage of the, uh, of the condensate. Um, the direction of the slope should be away from the compressor, uh, and piping from the header to points of use should connect to the top or side of the header to avoid being filled with condensate. You can see here, that's what happened right here. It's being uh, connected on the top. Uh, and then drainage drop legs from the bottom should be installed to, to collect the condensate. I don't think we even show that, particularly in this picture. So. Just some tips there on uh, some uh, distribution system design. Let's see if there's any other questions here. Um, let me look in the chat here. Uh, there was a question, uh, just to clarify, uh, about one of the dryer technologies here. So we'll, we'll go over to that. And I think that was, um, what page was that? Yeah, just a couple pages here when he's talked about dryers and heater compression regeneration dryers as uh, shown right here. Uh, the heater compression dryers does require air from the compressor uh, at a pretty high temperature to accomplish regeneration of the uh, desiccant that's inside uh, these uh, vessels. And for this reason, I, I mentioned it's almost used almost exclusively with centrifugal or lubricant-free rotary screw compressors because they produce pretty high temperature air. The regeneration process, process takes place with the help of this high temperature air, requires approximately 15 to 20 percent of the dryer's nominal capacity. Now, if the compressed air has been produced using oil lubricated compressors, then you would even need an oil separating filter uh, fitted before the drying equipment. And in most cases, a, a particle filter is required uh, after uh, absorption drying. So uh, just a clarification uh, on that. Again, this is a good summary of the different types of dryers and the pros and cons in terms of achieving dew point or uh, power and being concerned about power consumption and then some of the um, qualifications, uh, special needs for each of these. So. Uh, see if there's anything else here. I don't see any other questions. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Chris uh, to wrap up with some closing comments. Thank you for your attendance today. Thank you, Mike. I would like to thank you all for attending our webinar today. As a reminder, the presentation materials and the playback link to the recording of today's webinar will be emailed to you sometime within the next couple of days. If you have any additional questions or feedback, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you again for attending, and have a great day, everyone.